It is one of the least known stories in American history. It is the story of black achievement and accomplishment. Against all odds, American blacks have built their own institutions, families, schools, churches, and businesses. Against all odds, American blacks have created great art and science, fought heroically in every American war. Against all odds, black men and women have worked endlessly to secure their own freedom and equality. The untold story of blacks in America is a 350-year saga of incredible achievements. This is that story. Hello, I'm James Avery, and welcome to the sixth episode of A History of Black Achievement in America. Now, for the blacks who rose to power during the Depression and war years, enslavement was a story told by their parents, or more likely, their grandparents. While still segregated, blacks as a political and social force in American society could no longer be overlooked. Franklin Delano Roosevelt promised a new deal for all Americans. Organizations like the NAACP and men and women such as Philip Randolph and Mary McLeod Bethune worked tirelessly to ensure that the New Deal included black Americans. During this time, two men, Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis, catapulted to international fame in sports. And once again, black Americans distinguished themselves in combat as the United States military moved toward an integrated force. Now, it was a move that paralleled what was happening in popular culture. Early black investment in black education was now paying off as men and women like Mary McLeod Bethune moved to high positions in the national political scene. The black leaders at this time were powerful advocates of equal opportunity, equal justice, and equal representation. Had there been an award for the American woman of the 20th century, it certainly would have come down to Mary McLeod Bethune and Eleanor Roosevelt. When the votes were cast and counted, Bethune would have been a clear winner for her accomplishments and the advancement she made for black education and equality. Born in South Carolina in this house in 1875, Bethune combined intellectual brilliance with an indomitable spirit of selflessness. As a child working the cotton fields, she dreamed of becoming a missionary in Africa, but it was not to be. Instead, she became a wife mother, and foremost, a teacher. Then in the 1920s, a transformation took place. She had a larger vision of her life's work. She expressed her vision in a letter to President Roosevelt, suggesting a comprehensive program for the full integration of blacks into the benefits and the responsibilities of American democracy. Bethune went on to create that opportunity. In 1935, she established the National Council of Negro Women, an organization to rally black women into one powerful effort to end discrimination, support education, and generally lift up blacks throughout the United States. Her political and social activism brought her into contact with high-level government officials, particularly the Roosevelts. For 65 years, the federal government had shown scant concern for its minority citizens. In a pivotal moment in U.S. history, Mary McLeod Bethune began a campaign to change this policy. In the early days before America's involvement in World War II, the NCNW allied itself with the NAACP and the National Urban League threatening a march on Washington, D.C. unless Roosevelt acted to end discrimination in defense industries. Dismayed over the thought of a massive march by blacks in the nation's capital, 
FDR agreed with his so-called Black Cabinet that included Bethune to end discrimination. On June 25, 1941, he issued Executive Order 8802, and the march was canceled. From then on, a non-discrimination clause was placed in all defense contracts, and a Committee of Fair Employment Practices was established to investigate all violations. This momentous event was the beginning of the federal government's involvement in guaranteeing equality for blacks and minorities. It was the cornerstone on which all black political and legal gains of the second half of the 20th century would be built. This was just one of Bethune's many accomplishments. Mary McLeod Bethune is an extremely important transitional figure between Booker T. Washington and W.B. Du Bois. Like Booker T. Washington, she emphasized self-help, and as an educator, she for 40 years educated generations of African-American female leaders. But like Du Bois, she believed in organizing, and she used her leadership in black women's organizations as a political foundation. And so because she was this leader who believed in black female leadership, she's certainly one of the most important women, not simply one of the most important African-American women in the 20th century. Bethune died on May 18, 1955, near Bethune-Cookman College, which she founded in 1923. One of the many living testaments to America's woman of the 20th century. For the first time, American blacks were heroes, not only to their own people, but to the whole nation and the free world. In 1936, Adolf Hitler, the new ruler of Nazi Germany, asserted that the Versailles Treaty ending World War I no longer applied to his country. He increased the Reich's military divisions to 36, and the dark clouds of war loomed on the horizon. At the same time, disquieting news about forcing Jews into concentration camps was coming out of Germany. Part of Hitler's rise to power was his claim of Aryan superiority that whites were better than other races. He declared that proof would come in the 36 Olympics to be held in Germany. But at the Berlin Olympics, one man, Jesse Owens, single-handedly thwarted Hitler's dream of proving Aryan superiority. Owens, a black man and a track star from Cleveland, Ohio, defeated Germany's prize athletes, winning gold in the 100 and 200 meter dashes, the long jump, and as a member of the 400 meter relay team, However, in the same year, a German heavyweight, Max Schmeling, beat undefeated Joe Lewis. The Nazi weekly journal Das Schwarzerkorp commented, Schmeling's victory was not only sport. It was a question of prestige for our race. But Joe Lewis, a black boxer and a son of a sharecropping Alabama family, would get his redemption two years later when he knocked out Schmeling in the first round of their rematch. Americans cheered, and African Americans and Jews celebrated the loudest. In their eyes, Lewis had vindicated American democracy. These early African American athletes broke down racial stereotypes and paved the way for many successful blacks in all walks of life in the second half of the 20th century. Jackie Robinson broke the color barrier in baseball in 1947. Ralph Bunch in 1950 became the first African-American to win the Nobel Peace Prize, and Gwendolyn Brooks, the first black woman to win the Pulitzer for poetry. Althea Gibson became the first black woman to win a Grand Slam tennis championship at Wimbledon. In politics, Shirley Chisholm became the first black woman elected to the House of Representatives, Thurgood Marshall was the first black appointed to the Supreme Court, and Oprah Winfrey was the first female black billionaire. As for Jesse Owens and Joe Lewis, 
Owens would pass into obscurity after the Olympics, but Joe Lewis would go on to become heavyweight champion of the world for many years and was one of America's most beloved sports figures. Blacks may not have had political and social equality, but this did not prevent them from achieving the highest levels of excellence in artistic expression. In the next segment, we shall see how blacks through hard work entered the film world, finally reaching the highest levels of performance and stardom by the 21st century. In the early part of the 21st century, black actors such as Denzel Washington, Eddie Murphy, Will Smith, and Holly Berry are superstars, commanding millions of dollars for their films, as well as earning critical acclaim for their performances. As pop icons and film stars, they are successful box office draws with all audiences around the world a sociological phenomenon that can trace its origins back to Hattie McDaniel, winning her Oscar in 1939 for her portrayal of Mammy in the mega-hit Gone with the Wind. For your kindness, it has made me feel very, very humble. And I shall always hold it as a beacon for anything that I may be able to do in the future. In the early days of movie making, Blacks made their appearance in mainstream films, usually as caricatures of themselves. Sadly, often portrayed by white actors. At the same time, as with other mainstream institutions, blacks created their own films to be viewed by black audiences. Such was the case with black director, producer, writer, Oscar Michoud, who now has a star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. However, with a growing black population and a general fascination with black culture, a new genre of film, black exploitation, emerged in the 70s. Movies such as Shaft led the way. These films were followed by the next black genre, urban films. In the 1990s, black director Spike Lee took urban films to a new level of success with a series of hits She's Gotta Have It, Do the Right Thing, and Malcolm X starring Denzel Washington. It started with Hattie McDaniel, a vaudevillian performer most of her life, who said of her Oscar-winning role of Mammy, I naturally felt I could create in it something distinctive and unique. Unfortunately, it took another 20 years before black actors were allowed to create powerful performances on the big screen. But once the door was open, black actors excelled. First, there was Sidney Poitier, with such memorable characters as Homer Smith in Lilies of the Field, for which he won an Oscar in 1963. For all of them, I should say a very special thank you. And Virgil Tibbs in The Heat of the Night. By the 1990s, black actors had come a long way from the caricatures of the early film days. Uh, Hurry up now. Uh, you gonna put your shoes on? Let them save them in case my feet wear out. There was everything from Eddie Murphy in comedies to Wesley Snipes and Samuel L. Jackson as the leads in blockbuster action movies. And by the 21st century, three blacks had become Hollywood superstars. Denzel Washington, who won an Oscar for his role in Training Day, is considered to be one of America's greatest living actors. Will Smith, a mega box office star, was the lead in Men in Black and I, Robot. And Halle Berry, who won an Oscar for her role in Monsters Ball. The story of a love relationship between a black woman and a white racist living in the South. America has always needed its black soldiers, and black soldiers have always responded, fighting heroically to preserve the nation's well-being and freedom. And given the chance to command, they excelled at that as well.
In the 21st century, the American military is the model of an integrated institution where men and women fight beside each other regardless of color. The military is an institution that shows that when all are given the same opportunity, all excel, producing the most powerful force the world has ever seen. Blacks began this long march to equal responsibility and opportunity when Frederick Douglass, at the onset of the Civil War, called for men of color to arms. Since then, blacks have been in continuous service to the United States defending the nation. After emancipation, blacks distinguished themselves in the Plains Indian War from 1868 to 1890 and the 9th and 10th Black Cavalry Regiments, known as the Buffalo Soldiers, earned 20 Congressional Medals of Honor. This was followed by combat in the Spanish-American War in 1898. General Black Jack Pershing, whose colorful nickname derived from commanding the 10th Cavalry Regiment, led his black troops up San Juan Hill. He said, we officers could have taken our black heroes in our arms. During World War I, 40,000 blacks fought in the 92nd and 93rd Divisions and distinguished themselves in the crucial battles of Chateau Thierry and Ballot Wood. Indeed, black soldiers were the only troops to receive the French Croix de Guerre and the Legion of Honor. In World War II, more than one million blacks served in the United States Armed Forces. They served in all branches of the military and distinguished themselves from Pearl Harbor to the Battle of the Bulge. But the most celebrated black veterans of World War II were the black fighter pilot units known as the Tuskegee Airmen. The 99th and the 332nd combat groups were among the most effective fighter groups in the entire Air Corps. Flying bomber escort and more than 15,000 ground sorties from May 1943 to June 9, 1945, the Tuskegee Airmen destroyed 251 enemy aircraft and never lost a bomber to enemy fighter pilots these airmen won more than 850 medals. A year before World War II began, Benjamin Oliver Davis Sr., born in Washington, D.C. on July 1, 1877, became the nation's first black general. Davis himself met with Truman and worked on some language in a bill that would uh, eventually lead uh, to the desegregation of the armed forces. No justifiable reason during and after the war, General Davis was instrumental in urging President Truman to desegregate the military. In 1948, Truman issued his historic executive order ending segregation in the United States Armed Forces. The process was completed after the Korean War. However, it was during that war that General Davis's son, Benjamin O. Davis Jr., commanded a fighter wing. He was promoted to Brigadier General in 1954 and in 1959 became the first black officer to reach the rank of Major General in the newly created Air Force. In 2002, he received his fourth star. But it was not until the Vietnam War that the integration of the armed services was truly put to the test. Here, black officers and non-coms were involved in every single phase of combat, with black officers commanding mixed units. One such black officer went on to particular distinction. Colin L. Powell, a major during Vietnam, would later rise through the ranks and become head of the Joint Chiefs of Staff during the 1990 Gulf War. For all the failures of the Vietnam War, integration of the armed services was a major success. 
Since then, soldiers of all races and ethnicities have trained and fought side by side in the American military. The armed services today are really serve as um, a, a kind of laboratory um, for um, racial integration. Uh, it has uh, kind of long served that function, and today you see um, numbers of blacks serving in the military um, uh, in greater numbers and, and with uh, greater facility and ease than um, uh, than we've ever seen, and. It's, it's a lesson in many ways for um, other areas of our kind of social life, for having the principle of merit actually mean something and stand for something. Duke Ellington was one of America's most cherished musical geniuses. With a career that spanned more than five decades, his music captured an American sound that was recognizable worldwide. He stands with America's greatest composers and performers. His band survived for nearly 60 years by adapting to the sounds of each passing decade while remaining true to its musical roots. He played for presidents, kings and queens, and the common people, giving over 20,000 performances over his career. He was the Duke, Duke Ellington. Born Edward Kennedy Ellington on April 29, 1899 in Washington, D.C., he was a natural musical genius. As a teenager, he studied the performances of contemporary jazz pianists Harvey Brooks, Oliver Doc Perry, and Louis Brown, fashioning his own unique style. Soon he formed his first band and began playing for private society balls and embassy parties. In 1923, Ellington moved to New York where he recorded Creole Love Song. But his break into the big time came through his engagement at Harlem's famous Cotton Club, owned by Prohibition mobster Oni Madden. From 1927 to 1930, Duke Ellington and his orchestra played nightly to New York's white elites. The Duke's stay at the Cotton Club became one of the legends of jazz. But what made the Duke and his band the most sought-after band in the country were weekly broadcasts on the new medium, radio. Quickly, recording companies realizing that Ellington had crossover appeal to white audiences flocked to his door. Other black greats like Louis Armstrong, Bessie Smith, Ella Fitzgerald, and Count Basie would soon make the leap to stardom. But it was the Duke who paved the way for 50s black musicians, eventually setting the stage for an independent black record company, Detroit's Motown Records, in 1959. By the 30s, Ellington had perfected his jazz style called swing. His music uplifted depression-weary America. His piece, It Don't Mean a Thing If It Ain't Got That Swing, all but defined the 30s as the swing era. It don't mean a thing, all you gotta do is swing. Makes no difference if it's sweet or hot. Ironically, Ellington's greatest sociological triumph was also his greatest personal failure. In 1943, Ellington was the first black booked into the white performance mecca, Carnegie Hall. The Duke chose to debut an avant-garde and poorly rehearsed jazz orchestral piece, Black, Brown, and Beige. According to jazz historian and author Will Friedwall, Ellington called his piece a tonal parallel to the history of the American Negro, and as such, its music has blood and spirit resonances. However, the music was panned by the critics. Ellington never performed it again. Duke Ellington said of all his music, I like any and all of my associations with music, writing, playing, and listening. We write and play from our perspective, and the audience listens from its perspective. If and when we agree, I'm lucky. When Ellington died in 1974, 
He was recognized along with Charles Ives, Aaron Copeland, and George Gershwin as one of America's great musical geniuses of the 20th century. In episode seven, black leaders intensify their efforts to obtain civil rights, desegregation, and freedom. And a new wave of black men and women bring their skills to every walk of life in America. Thank you for watching A History of Black Achievement in America. I'm James Avery.